Uh, we're ready to start with uh, the next presentation and the last one for the day, and then we have a tour, right? So, okay. So I'll be short. So, Vlad, he doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. If you were in Switzerland, you know how wonderful he is. If you weren't, you'll learn now. Um, he's an associate professor and head of the Department of Psychology and Counseling at Webster University, uh, Geneva. Okay, uh, he's published extensively uh, ready to start with uh, multiple the, the books and co-edited and edited books, today. lots of publications. Tour, right? I don't know how he does it, right. so um, sure. but so, and Vlad, more power to you. Maybe one day I'll figure it out. Um, he also is an editor of a Palgrave series on creativity and culture and editor of the Journal of Psychology and Open Access Peer Review Journal. So now you have two places to send your stuff. Um, <clears throat> and he received the Berlin Award from the American Psychological Association uh, Division 10, the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity of the Arts. This is for early career contributions, and he is very well deserving of that. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. Uh, it's really wonderful to have an audience, knowing that I'm in between this and a museum visit and drinks. I, I really appreciate you being here now. So I'm going to try to be very short, maybe even fit into the time I was allocated, um, and try to do another, another feat, which is to be at a creativity conference and barely mention creativity per se, because I'm going to introduce you to my, uh, my new topic, and I think together we're going to discover the, the relations between the possible and, and creativity. So how did I start with the possible? I actually thought deeply with myself, okay, why did I begin to be interested in creativity? And, and for about 10 years, I've been studying it as a sociocultural phenomenon. And I realized that this is the, the essence of it, that we as humans, human beings live not only in the here and now of our experience, like right now you're on sofas, the body might be hurting a little bit, right? Uh, you look around, you see colleagues who are equally tired, but we also are capable of getting out of the here and now and expanding it, enriching it by thinking about dinner, thinking about resting, thinking about a paper or a future holiday, remembering the past, imagining the future, considering alternatives, anticipating problems and continuously engaging in as if, what if and if only thinking processes. This is uh, clearly exemplified, for instance, by utopias and dystopias. So as a genre, these explorations of worlds that could be and might be, um, is definitely and, and has been very popular for, for a long time. But, no, I'm not doing it right. Excellent. So, uh, but also we see it with uh, children's play, right? Uh, play is practically that situation in which the child gives new meaning to the, uh, the surrounding reality. Uh, a bear and a bunny can become tea party friends and then objects can be transformed from what they actually are, which by the way the child never loses the notion of, into something else. Then literature obviously transports us from a here and now of sitting somewhere, hopefully under a tree, uh, in the beautiful garden here, uh, and, and reading into a parallel imaginary universe. The child and uh, all the devices we have, right, all these technological means we have, uh, help us expand and get out of the here and now. Messages from friends that live across the ocean, planning events that will happen, you know, even a year from now, it's all kind of technologically mediated. But beyond that, we can look at everyday objects, like a pearl necklace. We can look at cups and, and microphones and think with any object there is a, a canonical affordance, a traditional way of using it, and many, many other possibilities and other symbolic kind of uh, significations around it. A pearl necklace is a pearl necklace, but it's also much more than that, right? It is a, a jewelry, so therefore it is precious, it has a certain cultural understanding uh, around it, but you could also use it perhaps to wrap it around a group of crayons to put them, you know, to stay together. But would you do that? Not necessarily. Although this is definitely a possible type of action. So when we think about the vocabulary of the possible, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear from you uh, later on uh, more terms to add here, it really has a, a wide, wide range. And I, I firmly place creativity within this big umbrella, right? Uh, it's interesting also not only to think about what is associated with the possible, but also what might be 
counter to, uh, contrary to, or actually enabling the possible by constraining it. So when we think about determinism, convention, routine, ideology, the impossible, all of these are very useful categories to shape what, what the possible might, might mean. So what is the possible? If we look at a dictionary definition, it's interesting that we find two, two understandings of it, right? So this is taken directly from the dictionary. Being within the limits of ability, capacity, or realization. So it's a bit of this adjacent possible, and thank you, Wendy, for raising that to my attention. The, the thing that could be done, it is, uh, it is potential, it is, it is uh, easily accessible to us, so it is related very much to what is in the situation and could happen next. But another meaning of the possible is something that may or may not occur at all, right? Unicorns and all sorts of fantastic things are, are exist in our imagination but don't exist in reality. So in this kind of open meaning, the possible becomes a little bit separate from what is. It is in a way the, the, the contrary of what already exists. But interestingly enough, and I, I always love to go back to etymology whenever I can, the uh, mid-14th century old French possible, I should really speak better French, but, um, and directly from the Latin, which I don't speak at all, possibilis, I'm turning Giovanni, excellent, uh, what can be done from posse be able. So the possible, etymologically, relates to human action. The possible is defined in and through action and constrained by action. So this is a, a, a kind of a theoretical route that I'm going to take you down on. And thinking about what is the opposite of the possible, historically, obviously, the possible is very much uh, separated from the real or the actual. These are the two terms that come together. Aristotle was the one who focused us on this distinction between something being in potential versus in actuality, right? Something can either exist or not exist yet or never exist, but this, this is like the antinomy that, that most of the time structures the way we think about possibility. So the danger with this and, and the critique of this is that if we think of the possible in terms of potential and, and not actuality or actually the opposite of the actuality, the possible remains outside of the realm of the real and, and becomes even opposed to it. So here we, we go into um, a certain kind of hierarchy that is a bit implicit in society. If you think about education, there have been so many talks about how teachers appreciate what children can do and perhaps pay less attention to what they could do or especially their less relevant activities like daydreaming in the class, right? exploring possibilities. Perhaps they're not, they're not as useful. Or sometimes the possible becomes dangerous because it breaks us from reality, right? Illusion. Illusions and, uh, are, are definitely a realm of, of possibility but not reality. What I'm going to propose to you, and again, uh, the, those who know me and those I've talked to, you know that I'm firmly within a sociocultural pragmatist um, approach. So from this perspective, I will propose that the real is definitely not the opposite of the possible. And uh, to, to reinforce that, we have to just remember again that we live, as I mentioned at the beginning, at once in worlds of actuality and possibility. These things are not separated. Actually, they give meaning to each other. Our sense of possibility and its exploration are grounded, obviously, in what already exists. I mean, this mirrors very well the discussions we have in creativity about existing knowledge and, and what is being created. And ultimately, it is these experiences that transform and expand our real, what is real, both thinkable and doable for, in terms of our action. So there is a complex kind of connection between possibility and reality, and I'm not going to tell you from now what I think the, it's the actual opposite of the possible. I'm going to come back to it in the, at the very end of the talk. Another, another thing, I, I've started being interested in the possible in this notion for about two years now, and I, I kept seeing in, in recent years, well, for, for a very narrow understanding of recent, <laughs> this might be a bit old by now, but that in a lot of social sciences, people are really starting to go back to these ideas and to try to recover them. In sociology, uh, different authors promote the fact that we should look at social interaction, not only in terms of what is, but how they're oriented to a certain future. Uh, Appa Durai famously in, in anthropology called for the study of imagination, anticipation, aspiration. It would be great at some point to have a psychology, anthropology, perhaps, uh, conference on these topics. In psychology, Gergen uh, uh, invited us to do research that looks at possible futures, not only illuminated what is, which is very much the case of, of the research we do, but creating what is to become, which is also part of our research, but perhaps we, we don't as often tap into that. 
So in psychology, I'm going to do a little, very, very short review. There were four main topics that I found where the possible comes through very strongly. One, one of them is possible worlds. Another one is possible selves, possible futures, but also possible pasts. So let's very quickly go, uh, go through them. When you think about possible worlds, this is a big concept in philosophy. I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not going to even stand here and pretend that I fully, fully understand. It's full of, of logic and, and different mathematical relations, but there is a huge literature on on, on the concept of possible world. But if we take it closer to psychology, of course we have the function of imagination that, um, that, that operates in different ways. So there are people who see imagination as a process of filling gaps in our perception, our understanding of the world. So kind of repairing our experience that is often fragmented, the imagination being the glue to do that. Pella, Pratt and Cole, but also imagination as a way of expanding experience. It's exactly what I started from, that the possible enriches the here and now, Zitun and, and Gillespie. And if we think about possible worlds, of course we unavoidably go, to, go back to social life. There is so much possibility, potentiality and imagination in the way we live in society. Um, Anderson famously proposed the notion of imagined communities, raising to our attention the fact that we don't know each and every member of our community. We will get to know probably each and every member here of the conference, but we imagine our communities, we imagine our nations, and based on these imaginations, we, of course, uh, act in one way or another vis-a-vis uh, -vis in group members, out group members. So there is a, a keen role of the imagination in, in how society is constructed. Castoriadis, again, famously talked about the imaginary uh, institution of society. If we look at possible selves, this is a very old topic. I mean, it goes from 15th century up to today, uh, obviously. Pico de la Mirandola is one of my, was one of my favorite philosophers. I remember I was studying uh, his work a bit in high school, and I just fell in love with, with his texts. And um, what he was arguing is that human beings don't have a predetermined fixed nature. So remember, at that time, of course, there was a lot of, of, of exchange between religion and, and philosophy, as it is to some extent today. So it was quite a, an interesting and bold argument to say that human beings are open to a future. They, they're not predetermined. And, and he made this comparison to the rest of animals and plants and the natural world. Heidegger, if we jump many centuries uh, forward, design, which is one of his, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, one of his main notions, is this, is this concept that captures the person as a developing subject. And not only developing, but developing projects that are open towards the future. That's the whole kind of Heideggerian notion of this. And if we look closer to psychology, the exact notion of possible selves has been um, proposed by Marcus and, and colleagues and others who define it as conceptions of oneself in future states. So that's, that's one version of it, to imagine what you will be in a few years, in, in a decade, or, or even tonight, where and how you will be. But I would, I would argue that there is much more to a possible self than that. Uh, when we listen to Todd, and I know many other people share an interest in virtual reality, and when you build an avatar, you, you literally tap into this sense of possibility. What else can I be? What else could I become? Um, Jerome Bruner uh, talked about how these selves regulate aspiration, confidence, optimism, and their opposites. And we know this a lot from literature on self-efficacy, for instance, and a lot of other concepts that, again, I would argue, go back to this idea that we construct possible selves. Possible pasts is an interesting notion, uh, I think, especially in today's charged environment with all the post-truth rhetoric. So don't take me as saying that the, the past is always there to be, uh, you know, reinterpreted and, and it's always possible and open. No, that, that's not my argument. But we know from psychology for a long time, right, Bartlett and his studies of memory, that our memory is always reconstructive because the act of remembering is done in the present. It is about the past, it's done in the present in certain circumstances, and it's always oriented towards the future, because we remember for something, for the moment and for the immediate, immediate future or, or even the longer term future. James talked about meaning making and about creative writing and looking back at your history. You do it for the past, for the present, and also in many ways for the future. There is a huge literature on counterfactual thinking, I'm not going to get into that, but obviously this has been like the, the biggest area of study, a possibility in the past, imagining alternative versions, what, what if something you know, had happened differently? And then people talk about upward and downward con counterfactuals, when you imagine something bad uh, would not have happened or something good. There, there are many versions of that and then emotions come in and it's a very complex literature. And finally, prolepsis is a very interesting notion that says that when we collectively uh, think about the past, 
the future is in the past. The way we think about the past guides our future. Today in Europe, and sadly in many parts of the world, we, we tend to imagine a golden age of our country, you know, our countries. It has been so good. And then when you look at that period, it actually becomes very sad. But by just talking about how good it was in the past, the implication is that now we're bad, we're, 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 you know, we're the underdog, we need to defend ourselves. So the way we think about the past is the whole mechanism of prolepsis impacts the future. So there, there is a lot of possibility in the past, and finally, of course, I, this is really without, without saying, right, it goes without saying, possible futures. This has been the core area of, of a huge range of literature. In cultural psychology, Jan Walsiner has been one of the people who always advocated that we, our action and all our, all our psychological functioning is future-oriented. Then we have the, the immense domain of futures studies emerging after World War II, and actually in the spirit of thinking, how can we rebuild these devastated societies? How can we make them better? And one, one um, a kind of concept I want to call your attention to very quickly is this distinction made in future studies between forecast, which is often quantitative uh, based on this uh, assumption of uh, continuity between uh, past, present, and future, and very much predictive, the weather forecast, right? And foresight, which is qualitative, discontinuous, and open to multiple futures. In many ways, I think when people create, they're, they're very much based on this insight of having the foresight rather than the forecast. So it's, it's a lot of, this literature has many topics and many terms that could be of interest to us as a community. And finally, uh, anticipation studies was more recently born in a way out of this whole background. Roberto Poli is, uh, is not working very far away from, from this place. And he talks about anticipation, anticipatory behaviors as all those behaviors that use the future to decide the present. When you take an umbrella because you look at a cloudy sky, you engage in an anticipation behavior. Yeah? So, to summarize, the possible in psychology. One would imagine that uh, we, we should really be invested as a community to understanding the possible, but we're not that much. And if we look at the birth of information processing models, and I need to make a, a, a disclaimer here, this is not, these are not the models of the present, but it's the 50s and 60s and the whole cognitive revolution. There is a deep critique here, and, and what Hoffman called the birth defect, um, that organisms and above all human beings typically do not respond to stimuli, but they almost always act in order to create the stimulations or situations they're striving for. So instead of this very basic stimulus process and, and output kind of schema, we have to, to think more deeply about how we are guided by envisioned possibilities. And, and that has been gradually incorporated in, in cognitive science, and it definitely is the, the essence of sociocultural psychology, which is my, my area. Now, I, uh, in one slide, I'm going to tell you everything about sociocultural psychology. One thing you need to know, if you need to know one single thing, is that it really responds to this very deep Cartesian split that obviously uh, is so influential in our discipline, which is the, the separation between an internal and external environment, between self and others, between reality and possibility. So I, I see these things as connected. I think we, we saw today, for instance, how the person and environment can be studied and represented as two different bubbles that, of course, have arrows between each other, but they're still kept separate from each other. So that, that falls in line of the, the Cartesian legacy in many ways. What sociocultural psychology tries to do is to break that separation, not to ignore it, but to propose a, a, an interdependence, a dynamic, dynamic interdependence that is both contextual and developmental between these things. And um, its emphasis is very much on symbols and meaning and culture and action. And I would argue that first and foremost, and I hope those colleagues who work in this tradition would agree, cultural psychology studies the possible and possibility. If you look at Vygotsky, one of the, the, the founding fathers uh, of, of this field, his notions of the relation between perception and meaning in play, and the way meaning overcomes perception, and, and his concept of zonal proximal development, I think they really capture this possibility ethos. Bakhtin talked about dialogicality and the open emergent tension between meanings and voices. Ingun, uh, Ingun's presentation definitely built on that. Jerome Bruner, the big educational psychologist, was very much invested into understanding uh, his, one of his main books about possible worlds, actual minds, right? The possible in narratives, the way we build, the possible in, in narratives in education and uh, human development. And Valsiner, who I mentioned, also participates to, to this tradition.
So I'm going to propose very quickly my own model, because I, I said the theory, so I have to, I, you know, I committed to, to that. <laughs> so a theory of the possible that is grounded in pragmatist literature. So George Herbert Mead and neo-pragmatists like Alex Gillespie and Jack Martin. Um, the, the whole story is very simple, so I'm going to try not to complicate it too much. The fact is that we all live and occupy distinct positions in the world. In physical terms, I mean, look at us now, I occupy this position, you occupy different positions in the room, right? In social terms, we occupy different roles and, and identities. And in symbolic terms, we, we conceptualize the world differently from our position. These positions cultivate certain perspectives. So when, when I, from this position, look at you, my visual perspective is quite different from your visual perspective because you occupy a different position. When the teacher comes in the classroom, he or she has a different perspective than the students because they, you know, he or she has a, a different social position. Uh, the, the relation between physical, social, and symbolic is often a one of, of, um, of cooperation, in a way, here. Uh, interestingly and, and importantly, I don't mean perspectives as ideas or schemas or mental representations presentations. They're definitely part of it, but in a pragmatist tradition, perspectives are action orientations. The fact that I have a certain perspective on, on, on this object that tells me, okay, it's a cup that guides my action. The fact, the fact that through this perspective, I, I mostly use it to drink from it. If I would adopt another position of, um, of an artist, for instance, I could paint it or glue it on the wall, and there would be a very different action, right, that, that I have vis-a-vis -vis the cup. So perspectives are thinking processes, but they're also very much related to the way we act or we imagine we could act in reality. So in all contexts, and this is where the story of the possible comes in, obviously there is a multitude of, of positions we could occupy, right? Physically, we move around, so we see the world from multiple, you know, visual perspectives. Socially, we jump around, and, and we are both, you know, I'm speaking now, but I was in the audience a few moments ago, and, and that, the same thing happens to you. So we constantly jump between and exchange positions and perspectives. That is what young children do when they play. You remember the little tea, tea party kind of uh, scene. They, they try to gradually or, or systematically embody, you know, the host, the guest, and, and play these different perspectives out. So in doing so, we, we develop necessarily multiple perspectives on the world, and as a consequence, we open the world to something more than what is and to the possible. Let me exemplify this very quickly, really quickly, with a dot. <laughs> this dot could be anything. It could be an object, it could be an idea, it could be yourself. But let, let's say it's an umbrella for the moment. Um, so we have an umbrella. I, I'm really simplifying it, but I, I do believe that this could be applied to notions like democracy, you know, very complicated things as well. So obviously, uh, we, we have a certain perspective on umbrellas. We know what they are as objects. And I'm, I'm putting this in kind of a bold line because society also constrains the kind of subject positions we can adopt and the perspectives we would have on objects. These, these are not, they don't have equal opportunities to come about. There is, there is always a, a normative background to that. So I'm not going to ask you, I was, I was supposed to ask you, what do we do with an umbrella? But I think at this time you're very tired to play this game with me. Obviously, one of the the key societal um, dominant perspectives is that we, we shelter ourselves from the rain, but I'm sure Cassie would say, and, and many people who've traveled to Asia, I've seen a lot of people use umbrellas to protect themselves from the sun. So again, you see even the dominant perspective, it depends on the position, the cultural position you, you uh, occupy. But interestingly, there is always a new position and a new perspective to look at things. So for instance, this is, I googled, I didn't see this in anyone's house, it's quite funky. So there is an umbrella as a lamp, right? And um, this kind of challenges our initial perspective, and it, it, it forces us to reposition ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the umbrella. Hmm, this conventional object I've been using for so long can be something very, very different. A, a craftsman or an artist or a designer could think like that. And then, in this meeting between two perspectives, you know, we create a space. If we only have one line, we don't really have uh, truly a space. But if we have two lines coming together, we create a space of possibility where we can start wondering what else could an umbrella be? What else could be there, right? This is all from the internet, but they're, they're equally cute. So it, you, could, you could grow plants, you could make a skirt, it's, be quite good on a rainy day. Um, you can even make a, a stand for your uh, newspapers. I can't even begin to imagine how that is, but... So the bottom line is that, for me, the story of the possible is very much connected to what I call this uh, 
Let me try a new affordance. Oh, look, you see, yeah, there. The meta position, right? So the meta position happens or takes place whenever we have multiple perspectives on the same object, issue, problem, event, you name it, that opens our mind towards the fact that new things could exist. Because we, although we live in worlds of possibility, very often our actions are very much guided by, by the concrete affordances, the canonical affordances of things. And sometimes by accident or willingly, we put ourselves in this meta position. So, what is the possible according to this pragmatic theory? First of all, the, what is at the heart of the possible is difference, and in particular, differences of perspective. If there, if there was no difference between self and other, between how I see the world and you see the world, between how Westerners use umbrellas and, and Asians might use umbrellas, there will be no room for something new to emerge. Difference is really at the core of, of emergence and novelty. And, and I think in many of our studies in creativity, obviously through uh, concepts like openness to experience and all, we, we kind of captured that element. But there is something more than difference. The fact that we can engage in this kind of position exchange, that we can reposition ourselves, this is what allows us to develop multiple perspectives on the world. And this is not always easy, because it's very comfortable to be in our own position, isn't it? Think about having an argument with another person. How hard it is to allow yourself to say, okay, let me try to really understand this argument from their perspective. It, it, it can be very hard, right? Moving between perspectives and reflecting on what this movement brings about, it is what cultivates a sense of possibility. It is what allows us to start exploring uh, the, this, this space being created. And, and hence, for me, the possible is enabled in our uh, cultural and social life and, and biological life by the existence of these meta positions. So, I'm bringing you back at the very end on what is the opposite of the possible, right? So I, I concluded that it's not the real. No, in no way the real. Within this framework then, the opposite of the possible is the monological. So instead of differences, we have the denial of difference non-recognition for many, many, many reasons. It is this kind of imposed and differentiated sameness that kills off closes possibilities for self and other, right? And, and if we are to adopt this pragmatist perspective on possibility, um, we're gonna notice how many theoretical, practical, and especially ethical implications we can derive from it. This is a, a medieval classroom, and it's easy to, to bash medieval classrooms because I wasn't there and they can't respond. So I, I, know, I know historians, by the way, do amazing work to show us that the way we imagine people lived in medieval times, it wasn't really like that. They were, they were really humans, you know, like, like you and I. But I, I particularly, by the way, like the, the expression of this guy here. <laughs> I think we can all identify. But it was, it was this idea, right, that the, the teacher was standing up somewhere and, and students were down and this unidirectional transmission of knowledge, uh, which continues in education in many ways. I think the one thing that changed is that usually in amphitheaters today, you look up at the students, but, but you still command their attention. How open was this classroom? I'm asking, I'm not judging. How open was it to multiplicity, to different perspectives? How open are current classrooms to multiplicity? Or do we, do we operate within a monological framework of trying to get all these students to think alike and to think like us, basically, to transmit the knowledge we have, I'm gonna give it to you, right? So that is uh, the opposite of the possible. Another great example is the, the whole migration crisis and the whole discussion we have about, about immigrants and refugees, right? So we, are, we commonly see these images, which by the way, speaking of sameness and undifferentiation, you notice that, that they're, they're most often faceless, right? And this encourages the discourse of uh, invading army, disease spreading to Europe or to US or you know, build the wall, whatever, whatever. So the point is that if you think through a perspective of possibility, how much do we engage with the perspectives, the actual perspectives of people coming in to our country? Or do we already imagine for them a position, an intention, you come here to be a terrorist, you come here to take benefits, and we leave no space for the possible to emerge. In a conversation, if there is no voice from a certain side, of course there is no, no possibility as well. And I'm gonna end with uh, Twitter, 
I'm, I'm not on Twitter, by the way. People tell me I should be. But I, I studied Twitter with, uh, together with uh, my wife, Constance de Saint Laurent, and other colleagues. And I discovered something very depressing on Twitter. Because, I mean, you probably know it by now. Uh, the assumption is, and that was the whole enthusiasm, that the more we're interconnected, the more we have access to perspectives, isn't it? I mean, today, if you wanted to, you just Google what a, a person from South America says about whatever, and you get to know that information. How amazing is it? Do we learn? Do we engage with this perspective? Sadly not. That, that's what we discovered in political debates and debates about immigration, that Twitter, maybe because of how short tweets are, maybe because of another dynamic having to do with information bubbles and so on, creates space, spaces of sh uh, sameness and not of dialogue. There are no, m n not much actual debates happening on Twitter. And how do I know that? It's because people don't change their mind very often on Twitter. They just reposition themselves, my perspective of the world, my perspective of the world, and you can, you can say whatever. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe Twitter as a space of the monological? It's an open question. So where to from here? I, um, I finished a book actually called The Possible Theory. So any kind of feedback you can give me, it's still uh, in, in production and I'm, I'm yet to, to sign, hopefully soon, a contract with Oxford University Press. But I'm also uh, editing this massive project called The Polygraph Encyclopedia of the Possible. And Wendy and Ingun and Serena and Sergio, and if I forget anyone, I'm going to be in big trouble. But I have many section editors in the room who, who, uh, who helped me put together this huge project. So if any of you, by the way, has a notion in mind that could relate to this whole universe of possibility to talk to us. This is a project that will finish in 2021, so we have a lot of time. Another, another small project I'm, I'm trying to take this to is to look at um, one particular phenomenon, which is wonder and wondering. Uh, I, I also finished the book on that. I'm happy to share, by the way, with anyone who's interested in education with, with my colleague Monica and uh, her colleagues in Brazil, and also with the Lego Foundation. Uh, they're very interested in wonder within the, the process of creativity. So for me, wonder and wondering are these phenomena that, that open up possibility. That is what I would call entering the meta position, being put in a position of wonder. What else? What else could be there? How else can reality be? And finally, with colleagues from the Polytechnic of Milan who are here as well, Marita and Carmen, and uh, we're trying to develop a technique, so putting this in practice, can there be a tool that helps people tap into possibilities? So we're, we're looking at that and hopefully we'll report on it um, next year. So yeah, thank you. It's been a long day. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean... We, Questions, 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 questions. questions uh, I've been told. Yeah? No, you Thanks. Stand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bo. Uh, really exciting stuff. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, first comment is, I think you're a bit harsh on the information processing theories. I knew it. Yes. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, if you think about it, the uh, neural assignment and uh, mm. problem spaces, problem spaces are possibility spaces. Right. So, so there is actually a big link. So talking about possibilities is actually a way of getting the cultural, social cultural theories to talk with cognitive science, uh, right. regular sort of information processing science. So I would say... Uh, uh, I, we, we, we can discuss that. Also? I, I, I mean, definitely agree with that. If you yeah. want to write that entry on possibility spaces on uh, yeah. conceptual, great pleasure. Yeah. yeah. So, so the other comment is, uh, thank you for uh, introducing the notion of impossibilities. Uh, I think that's actually possibly the most exciting part. Uh, but I would like to ask a question about that uh, and your interpretation of impossibilities. Um, you related to uh, being a sameness kind of uh, way. Um, but I would say, might it not also be the case that uh, impossibilities have an ontological basis? Mm. That impossibilities are actually impossible? That it is, I can imagine you right. being 10 meters tall by me imposing some magic on you. That's right. very easy for me to do, actually. Now you're 10 exactly. meters tall. Easy to do. Exactly. But I that's impossible. I know that's impossible. You know that's impossible. Right. And it's actually impossible. Uh, it's not just because we have a shared agreedness that this is impossible, it's actually because it's actually impossible. So, so what is the ontological thank you status for, thank of you for the great possibilities? Yeah. In, in this book that hopefully will eventually come out, the last chapter is on the impossible, and I actually claim that the impossible is again not the opposite of the possible, and it goes back exactly to what you said. The fact that you can imagine me being up in the air, and I, I can't physically be, but you can still 
construct that perspective that creates a possibility of dialogue with the other perspective. Like the fact that I'm still on the ground can be in dialogue with that new perspective that could be hanging around in the air. So for me, the, the actual impossible or the actual opposite, the non-possible is the unimaginable and, and sameness. When, when the unimaginable is constrained by the fact that we don't want to imagine, we cannot imagine, we prefer not to imagine. So the non-possible is rather the opposite of the possible for me instead of the concept of the impossible. I think the impossible has been very fertile to promote human and development and evolution. How many things did we imagine that were impossible and still kept dreaming about them? The, the moon landing is a famous example. And then they were, they were turned into reality. So the impossible is actually a very fertile category, conceptually, I think, for the possible. I don't know if you are going in the same direction, but, but I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that the impossible and the imagined are any way outside of the story of the possible in, in this framework. Thank you. We can talk more during the break. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Additional questions? Everybody's ready for... Everyone is going for the tour. Yeah, the <laughs> tour and wine and... And that's all possible. Socialization. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a last... Maybe, oh, if, if, you want, a if you want to one take the last... One more. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's going to be a hard one. I'm going to regret it. <laughs> Actually, guys, the tour... Yes, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, yes. I'm curious uh, about uh, the association... Uh, uh, between uh, um, the um, perspective theory mm -hmm. and uh, divergent thinking, mm. because okay. it uh, seems uh, very similar. Right. Right, absolutely, and, and thank you for this question. I actually, I, I do prefer to take it, indeed. Uh, so I, I, this, this model that I presented to you, it actually was first born as a model of creativity called the perspectival model that I'm happy to share, and I completely stand by it, just that I, I try to reintegrate it within this bigger framework of the possible. So there is a huge connection between divergent thinking and this perspective making. What I do object to is the reduction to possibility and perspectives to thinking. As I said before, this whole uh, social cultural premise is that thinking is integral to human action. So uh, Vygotsky actually called, uh, called um, imagination uh, internalized, internalized play, for instance. So there is this fundamental dialogue between action and thinking that is much more promoted by sociocultural psychology. But as a basic principle, yes, divergent thinking is clearly an illustration of, of this dynamic in many ways. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank again. you. Thank you all. Thank you for staying up to. <laughs>